coins in. We can, you can just let them in. Right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another CAS webinar. Tonight we have space news from Roy Bryce. Then our main speaker for this evening is Dr. Steve Barrett, whose presentation is entitled Legacy of the Hubble Space Telescope. Our next Zoom webinar is on the 8th of February, when our speaker will be David Ramshaw, whose presentation is entitled Special Relativity Explained for the Layman with Practical Applications in Astronomy. So before we go, go to Roy, Janice would like to tell us something. Right, okay. over to you, Janice. Oh, thanks, Alice Amanda. Well, I thought I would just like to share this with you about my little grandson on Friday evening. He had a Zoom session with the astronauts on the International Space Station. Oh, brilliant. Oh. Yeah, my, da my daughter's a teacher, so she got the details from STEM, STEM resources. So she, she suddenly last week, she got an email and so she replied to it and they said, it's like first come, first serve. You know, and there's 70, 70 spaces on it. So she signed in about half past five and they managed to get on at six o'clock. So it was great. And he was so excited about it. He, he managed to ask them, he got managed to ask them two questions, you know. So that was good. And uh, they were telling them about the haircut, how they cut their hair. You know, they've got a hoover. You probably know all this, do you? But they did, well, there was some kind of hoover or something, you know, and they told them uh, but where they sleep, like it's the size of a telephone box and they've got all their, they've got all their, all their equipment, all their own personal things in this thing, like the size of a telephone box. And then they told them how they, you know, their plates are attached with Velcro and everything's like magnets. So it was really, really interesting. And yeah, oh yeah. And they told them, they said that, uh, they like to keep the astronauts happy, so they get wee treats. So one of the astronauts likes, you know, the jars of that fluff. You know that stuff you get, it's like marshmallow stuff. Do you know it? All right, uh -huh. mm -hmm. My daughter and I bought it years ago, once in Berlin, and then we come back and we noticed that Tesco had it. So one of them gets that, and another <coughs> one who's Italian, he likes some special kind of coffee. So he gets, he gets a special coffee, you know, but it was really, really good. and. It was really good, so he could tell me that, and I was saying to him, how many, how many astronauts are at the International Space Station? And he seemed quite surprised that I knew the name of it. <laughs> he goes, oh, there's six. But he asked good questions. He was asking, what was it he asked them? How do they, how do the things not float away when they're, when they're out doing their work? And then how long they were up there? So they were on for just under an hour. So I thought that was quite yeah. exciting. And my daughter yeah. said, yeah. actually, you could see you can see the astronauts in, uh, you know, Magnus's wee face, my wee grandson's face on it. So, yeah, I just thought I would share that with you. That's great. Right. Thank you. So, it was uh, exciting. Good. Thank you. Right. right, right. Now it's over to Roy for Space News. So can everybody um, mute themselves? So, hopefully if we got the Space News slide up. Yep, okay. So, hey, welcome everybody. Uh, the regular attendees will know that I'm interested in geology in general and geology on Mars in particular. Like Earth, Mars has experienced periods of extreme glaciation. As these ice ages come and go, glaciers expand and contract along the planet's surface, grinding huge boulders down into smaller rocks. By examining the size of boulders and rocks at specific locations on Mars, we should be able to understand the history of the Martian ice ages. However, there's a question mark hanging over the issue of Mars' ice ages. The planet's surface is populated with debris-covered glacial deposits. Were those glaciers the result of multiple ice ages over the past 300 to 800 million years ago? Or was there one continuous ice age that spawned them all? 
the scientists could answer that question, they'd fill in some large gaps in their understanding of Mars's history. Joe Levy, a planetary scientist at Colgate University, and his team examined 45 glaciers on Mars using high resolution images from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Their groundbreaking work is giving us a new understanding of the history of Mars, showing that Mars went through multiple ice ages. There's really good models for Mars orbital parameters for the last 20 million years, Levi said. After that, the models tend to get chaotic. So most of astronomers, you know that a planet's obliquity or axial tilt creates the seasons. Changes in obliquity trigger ice ages. While Earth's obliquity is relatively stable, Mars's isn't. Due to the gravitational torque from the other larger planets, Mars's axial tilt can change a lot and chaotically. Scientists think that it can reach values as high as 60 degrees and as low as 10 degrees. Compare that to Earth's 23 degrees, which is kept stable with the help of our large moon. There's a critical difference between studying ice ages on Earth versus ice ages on Mars. The glaciers that formed during Earth's last ice age, which peaked about 20,000 years ago, have receded to the poles and the mountains. But back when they expanded, they pushed a lot of rock ahead of themselves. After they receded, they left all those rocks behind. But Mars, the glaciers never receded. Instead, they're still there, covered with debris. So are the low break debris aprons, or LDA. All the rocks and sand carried in the ice have remained on the surface, Levi said. It's like putting ice in a fridge under all those sediments. Levi and his team knew that if they could just tease out the history of the Martian ice ages, they'd also be able to piece together the history of Mars's orbital obliquity and its climate. They could also learn what types of rocks and gases are trapped inside the ice. And if there are any microbes in there, they might even be able to determine what types. Levi came up with a way to study the history of the Martian ice ages. Since rocks get ground to smaller sizes over time, examining rocks could be the key. If Levi and his team could find areas on Mars with a steady downhill progression from larger rocks to smaller rocks, it would be evidence of one single long lasting ice age. But it all had to be done using orbital images from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's High Resolution Imaging Science Experiment, or HiRISE. The team used images of 45 different glaciers on Mars and got busy counting the size and number of rocks. HiRISE boasts an image resolution of 25 centimetres per pixel, about the same size as an average dinner plate. Ideally, Researchers would like to use artificial intelligence to identify, count and measure all these rocks on the glaciers. But AI couldn't handle it. The task required human eyes and minds. So Levi had 10 students work on the images over two summers. Altogether, the students counted and measured about 60,000 large rocks. We did a kind of virtual field trip, walking up and down these glaciers and mapping the boulders, Levi said. The results were unexpected. There was no orderly progression, but more of a random dispersal of boulders. That was a shock to the researchers at first. In fact, the boulders were telling us a different story. It wasn't their size that mattered, it was how they were grouped or clustered. This led the researchers to an important insight. Since the rocks weren't ground down, that meant they had to be moving inside the glacier rather than grinding together. The rocks were arranged in bands across the glacier surface, and Levi and his colleagues concluded that the bands signified different ice ages as Mars wobbled about on its axis. This image from the study compares the density of surface boulders in the Mullins and Friedman glaciers on Earth, you can see that on the left hopefully, with three sites on Mars. All the Martian lobate debris aprons are oriented with downslope to image bottom. Colour coding shows the kernel densities of the boulders. Boulders are clustered at all sites and on Earth, boulder bands align with bow-shaped or curved surface discontinuities, which we call ASDs. Again, you can see these sort of bow shapes here. And we'll see them again on Mars. 
The team's work showed that Mars went through between six and 20 distinct ice ages in the last 300 to 800 million years. Since those ice ages were caused by changes in the planet's axial tilt, the result is a record, an incomplete one, but still a record, of Mars's orbit and obliquity and its climate. The finding is important for other reasons too. These glaciers are a repository of evidence about Mars's history. They're little time capsules capturing snapshots of what was blowing around in the Martian atmosphere, Levi said. Now we know that we have access to hundreds of millions of years of Martian history without having to drill down deep through the crust. We can just take a hike along the surface. The glaciers might have something to tell us in our search for life on Mars too. If there's any biomarkers blowing around, these are going to be trapped in the ice as well. So, to change the subject. A white dwarf isn't your typical kind of star. While main sequence stars such as our sun fuse nuclear material in their cores to keep themselves from collapsing under their own weight, white dwarfs use an effect known as quantum degeneracy. The quantum nature of electrons means that no two electrons can have the same quantum state. When you try to squeeze electrons into the same state, they exert a degeneracy pressure that keeps the white dwarf from collapsing. But there's a limit to how much mass a white dwarf can have. Subramanian Chandrasekhar, I hope I pronounced that correctly, made a detailed calculation of this limit in 1930 and found that if a white dwarf has more mass than about 1.4 suns, gravity will crush the star into a neutron star or black hole. The Chandrasekhar limit is based upon a rather simple model, one where the star is in equilibrium and isn't rotating. Real white dwarfs are more complex, particularly when they undergo collisions. Binary white dwarfs are fairly common in the universe. Many sun-like stars and red dwarfs are part of a binary system. When these stars reach the end of their main sequence life, they become a binary system of white dwarfs. Over time, their orbits can decay, eventually causing the two white dwarfs to collide. What happens next depends on the situation. Often they can explode as a nova or supernova, creating a remnant neutron star but sometimes they can form something more unusual, as a recent paper in astronomy and astrophysics shows. In 2019, an X-ray source was discovered that looked similar to a white dwarf, but was too bright to be caused by a white dwarf. It was suggested that the object could be an unstable merger of two white dwarfs. In this new study, a team using the XMM Newton X-ray telescope to capture an image of the object, and that's seen here. They confirmed that the object has a mass greater than the Chandrasekhar limit. This super Chandrasekhar object is surrounded by a remnant nebula with high speed winds. The nebula is mostly made of neon, seen as green in the image above. This is consistent with the object having been created by a white dwarf merger. It's probably got a high rotation, which prevents the object from collapsing into a neutron star. Within the next 10,000 years, the object probably will collapse to become a neutron star, probably creating a supernova in the process. It seems that a white dwarf can break the Chandrasekhar limit, but only for a while. And back to Mars. Who's got an even bigger grid than 10 years ago? This weird looking crater on Mars. These two images were taken by the high rise camera and shows how Mars's surface is changing over time in this case due to thermal erosion. The first of these images was taken in 2011 and the other in December 2020, at roughly the same season, and it shows a few different changes. There are colour variations that are caused by different amounts of bright frost over darker red ground, according to the Heart Rise team. You'll also see some of the blobby features have changed shape due to the heat of the sun causing sublimation when a solid turns directly into a gas, bypassing the liquid phase. This thermal erosion has made the mouth of the face larger, and the nose, which consists of two circular depressions in 2011, have now grown larger and merged. The MRO is one of NASA's oldest and longest lasting spacecraft. The mission launched in 2005, arrived at Mars in 2006, and it's been monitoring Mars ever since. High-rise is the most powerful camera ever sent to another planet. 
that's provided a plethora of incredibly detailed images of Mars's features, including this one of an avalanche in progress. But one major benefit of long-lasting spacecraft is being able to monitor changes in what's been observed. The high-rise team documenting the smiley face I showed you a second ago for over a decade which means we now have a good side-by-side -side comparison of surface changes right before a rise. Measuring these changes throughout the margin year, scientists can understand the annual deposition and removal of pearl of frost. And monitoring these sites over long periods helps them understand longer term climate trends on the red planet. I thought this was quite an interesting article. Again, as you know, I try and choose things that are a bit odd just because there's less chance you've already seen it. Two scientists working at the Institute of Celestial Mechanics and Ephemeris Calculation in Paris have just shown that the influence of Saturn's satellites can explain the tilt of the rotation axis of the gas giant. Their work, published on 18th of January 2021 in the journal Nature Astronomy, also predicts that the tilt will increase even further over the next few billion years. Rather like David versus Goliath, it appears that Saturn's tilt may in fact be caused by its moons. This work shows that the current tilt of Saturn's rotation axis is caused by the migration of its satellites, and especially by that of its largest moon, Titan. Recent observations have shown that Titan and the other moons are gradually moving away from Saturn, much faster than astronomers had previously estimated. By incorporating this increased migration rate into the calculations, the researchers concluded that this process affects the inclusion of Saturn's rotation axis. As its satellites move further away, the planet tilts more and more. The decisive event that tilted Saturn is thought to have occurred relatively recently. For over three billion years after its formation, Saturn's rotational axis remained only slightly tilted. It was only roughly a billion years ago that the gradual motion of its satellites triggered a resonance phenomenon that continues today. Saturn's axis interacted with the path of the planet Neptune and gradually tilted it until it reached the inclination of 27 degrees observed today. These findings call into question previous scenarios. Astronomers were already in agreement about the existence of this resonance. However, they believe that it occurred very early on, over four billion years ago due to a change in Neptune's orbit. Since that time, Saturn's axis was thought to have been stable. In fact, Saturn's axis is still tilting, and what we see today is merely a transitional stage in the shift. Over the next few billion years, the inclination of Saturn's axis could more than double. Just going to try and get that animation to work again. Somebody joins it. Flipped. There it goes. The research team had already reached similar conclusions about the planet Jupiter, which is expected to undergo comparable tilting. Sorry, somebody else joining. <laughs> uh, I'll start that again. The research team had already reached similar conclusions about the planet Jupiter, which is expected to undergo comparable tilting due to the migration of its four main moons and to resonance with the orbit of Uranus. Over the next five billion years, the inclination of Jupiter's axis could increase from 3% to more than 30%. And finally, some sad news. I've been including items about NASA's Mars InSight spacecraft on the surface of the red planet as I got to hear about them. For years now, scientists have been trying to get the spacecraft to deploy its temperature probe several meters down into the Martian regolith to sample the planet's temperature. They've tried going in at different angles, using a spacecraft shovel to pre-dig a hole, and even pushing it down from above to help its hammering efforts. They've tried everything they could, and unfortunately, all efforts have failed. This week, the mole has been announced dead, and we won't get the detailed temperature readings from the interior Mars that we'd hoped for. Fortunately, there's still plenty of operational science instruments on board in sight, and it will continue to send us back fascinating discoveries about the red planet. It was a valiant effort. Unfortunately, it didn't work. As usual, thanks to Universe Today people for the newsletter that gives me all this up-to-date information that I give to you and I use to compile this presentation. So 
that's the space news for tonight. So back to Alice Amanda. Right. Thank you very much, Roy. That was really interesting. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, right. So, um, doc, on a Dr. Steve Barrett now. Dr. Steve Barrett is a senior research fellow in the Department of Physics at the University of Liverpool. His research interests have centred around the applications of imaging and spectroscopy to fields such as nanoscience, geomaterials, biomedical imaging and infrared spectroscopy. He is an expert in image processing and image analysis and has written image analysis software that has been used by researchers throughout the world. His teaching to undergraduate students has covered many topics and included supervision of astrophysics students on astronomy field trips to the, I'm maybe not going to pronounce this right, Tidy Observatory in Tenerife. His interest in astronomy predates his professional career as a physicist. He has given hundreds of astronomy related talks to astronomical societies, special interest groups and schools to an audience totaling over 10,000 people. As a result of giving these outreach talks, he was awarded the Sir Patrick Moore Prize in 2019 by the British Astronomical Association. So let's give Steve the usual Kaz Warren welcome. Thank you all very much. Right. Let me just sort my camera out. and get rid of the annoying control panels. Okay. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to Clydesdale AS this evening. So this is Legacy of the Hubble Space Telescope. I originally wrote this talk when the Hubble had been operational for about 25 years. It's now been operational for about 30 years, so it's another anniversary to bring back this talk. Excuse me. So there are very few people who won't recognize the Hubble Space Telescope, not just astronomers, not just amateur astronomers, but if you were to show this picture to the man in the street, the average Joe, they would probably still recognize what it is you're talking about. There are very few scientific instruments that actually have touched the public consciousness as well as the scientific community as much as the HST, the Hubble Space Telescope. So what I'm going to be covering in this talk is a little bit of background on the need for a space telescope and why we don't use ground-based alternatives all the time, why we have a mix of the two. I'll say a little bit about the history, why the mirror was flawed and how the optics were fixed in the early days. And then a little bit about the legacy. What has the Hubble Space Telescope done for our understanding of the universe and how has it brought the public along for the ride? And then I'll recap again at the end where things are heading in the future. Are we looking for more space telescopes or are we looking to improve ground-based telescopes? So firstly, I think it's useful to remind ourselves the huge variation in the size of the collecting lens or mirror of telescopes in the last few decades. This isn't every telescope ever made, I'm sure you appreciate. If we look in the top left, we see the one meter or 40 inch diameter lens of the Yerkes refractor. And that, of course, looks tiny compared to the various mirror sizes of the reflecting telescopes that have come online since then such as in the middle of the last century, the five metre or 200 inch hail telescope here, even the five metre mirror is looking tiny compared to some of the monsters that will be coming online soon. The largest telescope in existence at the moment is the Grand Telescopio Canarias on the Canary Islands, uh, and that is about 10 metres or so in diameter. 
strictly you can't talk about diameter when the mirror is made of lots of hexagonal segments, but that's close enough. And you can see in the not so distant future, we'll be looking forward to the 30 meter telescope and the 40 meter diameter European extremely large telescope. Despite its rather dull name, it's going to be an absolutely amazing uh, telescope. And if you can't quite see it, there's a human to the same scale and there's a basketball court and a tennis court down at the bottom, just again to give you an idea of scale. So these are all of the telescopes, including space telescopes, which are down there in the bottom left part of this diagram. So in the bottom right of that red rectangle, there's the Hubble Space Telescope, a very modest size, barely any larger than any of the telescopes that are shown here. Uh, we also have Gaia and Kepler, which I'll mention a bit later, and the James Webb Telescope. But that is just a way of putting in context the fact that the Hubble Space Telescope mirror, being only 2.4 meters in diameter, is actually very small compared to the sort of size of telescopes that are currently in existence or coming online very soon. So a reminder that over the last 400 years or so since Galileo's first telescope, there's the Yerkes uh, refractor on the left, one meter or so in diameter. Lenses gave way to reflecting surfaces. And in the, uh, on the right there, we have the 200 inch or five meter Hale telescope, which was the largest telescope in the world in the middle of the last century. Lenses became impractical, so we moved over to mirrors. But still, there was always this quest for larger and larger objectives, regardless of whether it's a lens or whether it's a mirror. We always want to collect more light with larger mirrors, and that's because larger mirrors have two principal advantages. Firstly, they collect more light, so we can see fainter objects if we collect more light. And secondly, the larger uh, an objective is, the larger the lens or the mirror, then the higher the resolution, the more detail we can see. So we can see more detail in smaller objects or perhaps the same object at a greater distance if we have greater resolution. So there's always that drive to larger telescopes. So if we have large and in some case huge telescopes on the ground, why put a small telescope in Earth orbit? Well, of course, the reason is to get above the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is turbulent, chaotic, and therefore, if we're looking at light that's coming through the Earth's atmosphere, there will always be some distortion. And so why don't we put a large telescope in orbit above the Earth's atmosphere? Well, that would be a great idea, but at the time the Hubble Space Telescope was built, it had to fit inside the cargo bay of the Space Shuttle. And that effectively dictated the largest telescope you can possibly build. You take the size of the cargo bay of the Space Shuttle, and then you say, right, what can we design that will fit in that space? And the result is a telescope with a 2.4 meter diameter mirror. So yes, it's not particularly large, but we still get that advantage of going above the Earth's atmosphere. If you compare the Hubble Space Telescope with a telescope of a similar size down on the ground, then the Hubble Space Telescope would have a resolution. It'll be able to see detail of order 10 times better, 10 times the resolution, simply from taking it from within the atmosphere to above the Earth's atmosphere. So a 10 times improvement, certainly worth having. So let's think about the history of where it all started. What do you think is the first date in the, in the odyssey of the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, it's perhaps a little earlier than you thought. 1970 is when NASA started planning for a large space telescope, the LST, as they called it then. So remember, men were still on the moon. This is in the middle of the Apollo program. They were already then, some 50 years ago, planning for a space telescope. That was the first milestone. Any thoughts on what the second milestone might be? Well, they canceled it, okay? Congress said, well, great idea, guys. Uh, the science is wonderful, but it's too expensive. So it was canceled. The scientists, of course, were furious. The astronomers were saying, we must have a space telescope. So there was all sorts of push to get more funding. And ultimately, it led to the collaboration between NASA and ESA. NASA couldn't gain all the funding they needed from the American system, from Congress. And therefore, by buddying up with ESA, they could spread the financial load. And then it was agreed that it should be possible to fund a space telescope. 
1978, it was agreed that with extra money coming in from ESA, it was possible to fund this project. The, the, uh, the tendering went out and the spacecraft was constructed by Lockheed and the optical telescope assembly by Perkin Elmer. We might think of the Hubble Space Telescope as simply a telescope that happens to have been launched into space, but NASA don't think of it quite that way, NASA or ESA. Basically, it is a spacecraft and it's a spacecraft that happens to have a telescope inside it. And when it comes to designing and building, you don't give all of these jobs to the same people. Lockheed had extensive experience on how to build spacecraft, so they got the job of building what you might call the outer part, the, the spacecraft itself, the power systems, the, the way it points, the way it's stabilized, and the optics inside were given ultimately to Perkin Elmer to produce the optical telescope assembly. So that was the late 70s. In 1979, construction of the primary mirror actually began. Perkin Elmer took their job to make a 2.4 meter mirror, and they took that seriously. And after two years, they declared that the polishing of the mirror was complete. It was realized very early on that the main mirror, the primary mirror, of course, is an absolutely essential part of a telescope. And because it was considered to be a little bit risky, how do you know you're going to make sure that, teles that mirror is made absolutely perfectly? It was agreed that right at the start, there would be a backup. In other words, Perkin Elmer were told, go make a mirror 2.4 meters in diameter, according to this specification, this particular curve. And at the same time, Kodak were told, make a backup completely independently, different design, different manufacturer, different grinding, different polishing, different testing, completely independently, just in case Perkin Elmer somehow got it wrong, then there would be a backup. But in 1981, Perkin Elmer said, we're done. We've finished the mirror, we've, uh, we've ground the mirror to the right shape, we've polished it, we've coated it, we've tested it, and it is absolutely perfect. The best mirror ever made. And therefore, once they declared that it was perfect, there was no longer a need for a backup. And so Kodak were told, right, um, thank you very much for making a backup mirror, but it won't be needed. The backup mirror went into the Kodak Museum. That's, of course, relevant for what comes next. 1983 was the original planned launch date. And at that point, the Large Space Telescope was actually named the Hubble Space Telescope in honor, of course, of Edwin Hub Hubble, who'd made so many seminal discoveries and observations about the expansion of the universe and galaxies receding from us. But unfortunately, uh, although originally planned for launch date in the early 80s, there were a number of different delays. 84, 85, 86, the launch date kept getting pushed back, delays due to Perkin Elmer, delays due to Lockheed. By 1986, the budget had already hit somewhere of order $1 billion, and it was still rising. And outside of their control, unfortunately, 1986 was the Challenger disaster, which grounded the entire shuttle fleet for quite a while. And even when the shuttle was then flying again, there was then a backlog of satellites that needed to be launched into orbit. And uh, the military tended to get the uh, cherry pick the first flight. So it wasn't until 1990 that the Hubble Space Telescope finally was launched into Earth orbit. Some 20 years after the initial idea of let's build a space telescope. By that time, the cost was estimated to be of order two and a half billion dollars. And this does not include, I believe, the costs of the future service missions, which we'll come to shortly. Before we go any further, it's just making, worth making a note that the design of the telescope is a so-called Ritchie creation design. Doesn't matter if you don't know what that is, but the most important thing is that the primary mirror is a particular shape, which is called a hyperbolic shape. Now, perhaps you're used to the idea of a parabolic mirror focusing light from infinity to imperfect focus. But the last big telescope to ever use a parabolic mirror was the five meter or 200 inch Hale telescope on Palomar Mountain. 
So why did people change from parabolic mirrors to hyperbolic mirrors? Well, a, pa a parabolic mirror will indeed focus light perfectly from infinity, but only from one point in the sky. When you go off axis and start to look uh, away from the center of your field of view or the center of your photographic plate, whatever it is you're using, you'll find that a, par a parabola produces aberrations. And so, <coughs> excuse me, and so after the middle of the last century, it was decided that hyperbolic mirrors would be used because they don't suffer from the same aberrations. There is one downside, and that is a parabolic mirror can be used to focus light from infinity, and you can check that it comes to a good focus. But hyperbolic mirrors have to be used in pairs. You can't take one hyperbolic mirror with that particular shape and expect it to focus starlight. They only work when you have a primary and a secondary. So when it comes to testing it, you have to find a clever way of testing whether your hyperbola is the right shape or not, because you can't simply point it at a distant star and see if it comes to focus. And the last thing you want to do is to test two mirrors at the same time, the primary and the secondary. So although in principle they could focus starlight or focus a distant point, if it doesn't work, how do you know if the error is in the secondary or the primary? You really need to test them separately. So you have to find some way of testing a hyperbolic mirror, which is not designed to focus starlight on its own. And that's relevant for what happens when they put the telescope in orbit and then try and focus on a distant star. They could not get it to focus. What they were hoping for is something like on the left hand side, nice point light stars. If there was a, a diffraction cross, that's just an artifact of the way the secondary mirror is held in place. So we don't worry about the X that's going through that bright star in the middle. All of the, all of the stars are effectively pinpoints or as close as uh, the laws of physics will allow. But what they actually saw was something like what we see on the right hand side there. A lot of the light of that central star is focused to a very fine point, but quite a substantial amount, maybe 10% or more of the light is thrown into this horrible halo surrounding the star and all points in the image would show that sort of distortion or aberration. They tried moving the mirror backwards and forwards trying to make sure they were at the correct focus point but they couldn't get any better than what's indicated on the right hand side. Eventually it was finally admitted that the mirror was made with so-called spherical aberration. The mirror was not focusing correctly. What do we mean by spherical aberration? Well, let's ignore the fact that it's a hyperbolic surface for the moment. Let's just imagine we take an ordinary uh, telescope with a parabolic mirror, which is focusing light from infinity to a point. So light coming from a long way off, effectively parallel rays, hit the mirror and then come to a focus. With spherical aberration, what that means is light hitting a different part of the mirror will come to a focus at a different point. So for instance, light hitting uh, at that particular point, the focus is now here rather than there. It's not coming to quite the same focus. And the further out we hit the light on the mirror, the worse the problem becomes. If we look at the light hitting close to the edge of the mirror, we find it comes to a focus in a completely different region compared to what we just saw for the other two light rays. It's like having a mirror with a focal length that depends on where you hit the mirror with the light, whereas what we want, of course, is a mirror with a specific focal length that brings the light all to a prescribed focus. So we can put our detector, in this case it would be a, a CCD detector, we can put that somewhere in the middle of all of these light rays, but that's not very satisfactory. Uh, we could say, well, why don't we move the detector until we've got to the point where most of the light is coming to a nice focus. So most of the black lines here are coming to a focus very close to the CCD, but clearly light from the edge of the mirror is coming to a focus too soon and then producing this out of focus halo around the star. 
So that's explaining what it is we're seeing. And it didn't take too long to figure out if that's what you see on the right hand side, it's being caused by what we see on the left hand side, light hitting the edges of the mirror are not coming to the focus correctly spherical aberration. It's called spherical aberration regardless of whether the actual shape of the mirror is a sphere or whether it's simply a parabola or a hyperbola that's been made to slightly the wrong shape. So it's a generic way of describing that type of aberration. Remember that is what they were hoping to see, nice pinpoint stars. NASA pointed out that well, yes, it's not focusing well, but we're still doing better than we would have done if this telescope was on the ground. That top picture has been blurred to show you what you would expect if that same 2.4 meter mirror was placed on the ground and you were looking through the turbulent Earth's atmosphere, you would get a blurred image much like the top one. Okay, it's all very well saying it's not as good as it should be, but it's better than if it was on the ground. Well, sure. But the taxpayers of Europe and America have just spent $2 billion or more to get it into orbit. And if we're not going to get the improvement specified, something is obviously very wrong. How could such a mistake be made? Tests carried out on the mirror after it was ground and polished and then coated suggested that it was the most precisely figured mirror ever made. The surface roughness, the difference between the mountains and the valleys, the bumps, if you like, in the smooth figure of the mirror, were of order 10 nanometers, 10 billionths of a meter. That possibly doesn't mean too much to you. So just imagine if the mirror was scaled up until it was the size of the Earth, then those bumps would be of order a few centimeters in size. If you take the 2.4 meters of the mirror, scale it up until it's the size of the Earth, then that shape that they generated had a roughness of just a few centimeters. Unfortunately, it wasn't the right shape. It was indeed incredibly smooth and it was incredibly precise. It was just precisely the wrong shape. They had made an error. It was off by about two microns. In other words, where the mirror is in the middle and where the mirror is towards the outer edge, the outer edge was off by about two microns, two millionths of a meter. And if that doesn't sound much, remember that's quite a lot compared to the wavelength of light. If you want all the light to come to a good focus, you want the figure of the mirror to be good to a very small fraction of the wavelength of light. And if the wavelength of light is about one half of a micron, then you really want your surface made accurately to within a few tens of nanometers. But it was off by two microns, hundreds of times larger than you would expect. And it comes back to the fact that this mirror is not a simple parabola. The mirror is hyperbolic. Hyperbolic mirrors don't bring starlight to a focus, only in combination with other mirrors or with other optics in your test rig. So you can look at a hyperbolic mirror and with the right sort of optics, you can sort of fool the mirror into thinking it should be focusing to a particular point and then you can check that it does. But these optics that you use in your test rig, the technical term is a null corrector, but let's not worry about that. These various bits of optics, a combination of mirrors and lenses used in the test rig were set up incorrectly. One of the lenses in the null corrector was misplaced because it's believed that there was a washer in place that just pushed the test rig about a millimeter away from where it should have been. So this is a rather long focal length, but a millimeter is huge when you're talking about trying to make a mirror precise to within tens of nanometers. <sighs> oh. Yeah, a simpler test would have revealed the fault. And Perkin Elman knew that. They knew that a simple test would have revealed any problems, but they said there's no need to do a simple test because we've just done a really complicated test and it passed that test with flying colors. So there's no need to do a much simpler test that an amateur might have said, well, why don't you just test like this? It will only cost a few thousand pounds and it will convince you that everything's okay. Perkin Elmer said, 
we know everything's okay because our rather complex test said everything is perfect. Of course, there is a backup mirror and that was made and tested independently. So probably didn't suffer from the same problem, but that backup mirror is on the ground and the problem mirror is in the Hubble Space Telescope, which is now in orbit. Quite a problem and quite a headache. There's only really one thing that saved the Hubble Space Telescope from a total and utter disaster, and that is that it was designed from the outset to be serviced by shuttle astronauts. Not simply a shuttle to launch it, but a shuttle to take astronauts up and to tinker with it and to replace cameras or spectrometers or anything else as necessary. So other ideas were brought forward. Is it worth sending the shuttle back up, capture Hubble again and bring it back home again and swap the mirrors out? Well, we'll have to double check the other mirror first, but it was decided, no, there is a simpler solution. There is already on the ground, thank goodness, a duplicate camera. It is not that unusual to fly instrumentation and make a duplicate which stays on the ground when you have a flight ready version, you keep a duplicate and if there's any problems, you can check out the one on the ground to see where the problems might lie. So on the ground was a duplicate camera, which is essentially identical to the one that's in the Hubble Space Telescope. And what they realized was, well, as long as we know what the problem with the main mirror is, we can do something about it. We can't physically change the main mirror, but if we talk to Pel Perkin Elmer and figure out why their test was wrong, and ultimately that's what revealed the fact that the test rig was out by a millimeter or so, 1.2 millimeters. Once they realized the test rig was out, they knew precisely how wrong the mirror was. They knew it was very smooth, and now they know precisely what the shape is. They know what the shape should have been, and now they know what the shape is, so they can figure out what corrective optics do we need to allow that mirror to work the way it should. And so they sat down with the camera that's sitting on the ground, and they said, right, what mirrors do we need to add to this camera? There's a mirror here which bounces the light coming from the telescope into the camera assembly itself. What do we need to change here or in front of this in order to correct for the known error of the primary mirror? So they figured out what they need to do and effectively they then had a corrected camera which they figured if we give that to the astronauts, send them up to the space shuttle, they can take the old camera out, put this new camera in and if this new camera is designed the right way, it should work even with the mirror the way it is. Great, we have a solution. Well, okay, that's a solution for one of the cameras, but actually the, the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is more <laughs> than one camera and more than one spectrometer. So they also had to think about how do we deal with the other instruments? For everything else, it was decided that what they would take up is a set of corrective optics, which would be placed inside the Hubble by sacrificing one of the existing instruments. This is the so-called CoStar corrective optics. This is the actual CoStar itself after it came down, which I'll describe in a moment. But just to give you an idea of what it is, that little model on the right-hand side gives you an idea of how it works. It's effectively a lot of small mirrors. There's no need to make large corrective mirrors. The mirrors can be quite small, just centimeters in size. And they're all on little flip down arms, like a sort of Swiss army knife. So what that means is when this is in place behind the main mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope, before the light comes from the telescope, before it reaches a particular instrument, they will bounce it off one of these mirrors, which is brought into position by activating one of these arms, which moves the mirror into the light path. And then as long as these mirrors are made precisely the right shape to correct for the error in the main mirror, they will send corrected light to the other camera or the other spectrometer or any other instruments they wish. So that was the plan, fix the camera and send that up. And for everything else, use the CoStar Swiss Army knife of corrective mirrors. So just again, an aside, remember, although it's tempting to think about the Hubble Space Telescope as basically a large camera, because of course we see all of the images that it produces, but actually at any given time, the telescope has had at least two cameras and two spectrographs on board, sometimes more. 
and they've been swapped out and upgraded during the various service missions, which we'll see in just a minute. And what's going on in the actual instrumentation part of the Hubble Space Telescope, cameras might be labeled wide angle or high resolution. The cameras aren't necessarily different. It's a question of what the focal length is of the telescope that's used to send light to those particular cameras. And just to give you an idea of scale, the focal length, the nominal focal length of the Hubble Space Telescope is about 58 meters. And the size of the chip in one of the most sophisticated cameras that they have is indicated by this thing in my hand here. The largest chip they use in the CCD camera is about four centimeters on a size. It's a, about four, um, 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, about 16 megapixels, one of the latest cameras they've introduced. So imagine that's the size of the sensing CCD and it's on the end of an object which is basically a 58 meter focal length. So that reminds you that the Hubble Space Telescope looks at a very, very small patch of sky. That's just the same thing a little larger. And again, this reminds you that the telescope is actually only a small part of the long cylinder that we tend to think of as the telescope. There's the primary mirror there, the 2.4 diameter mirror. 2.4 meter diameter mirror. There's the secondary being supported by a, a couple of spiders, which is what gives you the, uh, the cross through the various bright stars. So the secondary is here, the primary is there. So the total length of the telescope is only a small fraction of the total length of this cylinder. The front is essentially empty and acts like a lens hood. And most of the instruments are sitting behind the primary mirror. The camera is slotted in from the side, also one of the spectrographs, and the other instruments are in this orange section at the back. And we'll have a little think about some of those instruments shortly. Other instrumentation around the outside is responsible for making sure that the telescope is pointing at the star you think it is, and for keeping it locked with gyros to keep it pointing nice and stably at a particular point in sky. The last thing you want is the telescope to be drifting whilst you're trying to take a long exposure. So let's have a think of what the shuttle actually did for the Hubble Space Telescope. I don't want to dwell on this too long, but I think it's useful to remind you during the timeline here, 30 years, an awful lot happened, especially in the first few years. So these various bars, I'm not gonna talk about the detail, but these things down here, if an acronym ends in a C, it's probably referring to a type of camera. And if an acronym ends in an S, it's probably referring to a spectrograph. Also there, we've got gyros and electrical systems because gyros occasionally needed looking at. These are the things that keep it pointing in the right direction. And the electronic systems and the electrical power supply from the solar panels also needed maintenance from time to time. So there's a camera. And one of the first things they did in the first missions was to take a service mission one. The first thing they did was to place camera one with camera two. Remember, camera two is the one that was on the ground. They fixed the optics in order to correct for what they knew was the figure of the main mirror, and then they sent that up. COSTAR is an extra Swiss Army knife of mirrors, and they had to get rid of one of the instruments to make enough space to put COSTAR in. So HSP was a photometer. It was designed to measure star brightnesses. They never managed to do that because the photometer was trashed as soon as COSTAR was put in. The asterisk in the two bars below is simply my shorthand for whilst the astronauts were there, they did a little maintenance and tweaked the gyros and tweaked the electrical subsystems. The astronauts were told, please get this right. We're going to put this new camera in and it has to work. We've spent a few years. We've admitted what the problem is. Now we think we have the solution. Please put this camera in and please don't break it because this has to work. This is not simply a question of if this doesn't work, then the Hubble Space Telescope is broken. It was couched in terms of if it doesn't work, this could be the end of NASA. American Congress and the European Space Agency are unlikely to put any more money into a NASA project if NASA can't get this right. No pressure, but guys, make sure this camera goes in and make sure this works. 
huge sigh of relief when they switched it on and tested and found that the new camera two did indeed produce the sort of pinpoint images that we've now become used to over the last few decades. There were more service missions, another one in about 97. And here you see they didn't do anything with the first four instruments, but here they've replaced one spectrometer with another spectrometer and they've replaced this spectrometer with another spectrometer. Why so soon would you start swapping out one spectrometer for another? Why change one instrument for another? Well, I say so soon, but remember, it was designed in the 70s. It was built in the 80s. By 1997, it's already old. Technology has moved on in the years that it was waiting for a launch and in the years that it's been in orbit. So if you have better spectrometers, then you swap out the old for the new whenever you have the chance. Service Mission 3 was designed to tweak a few things, mainly the gyros. They needed looking at and the gyros were fixed. Nothing much else was done, but that gray in the penultimate bar at the bottom there says that that particular spectrometer started to give problems. And the second part of service mission three, so that's the fourth mission, again tweaked some electrical subsystems and fixed that rather um, pesky spectrometer. This was also the opportunity to replace what looks like a camera here with what looks like a spectrometer. In fact, they're pulling fast one on us. That is another camera, although it looks like a spectrometer because it ends in an S. That's actually the advanced camera for surveys. So they're replacing one camera with another again because technology marches on. But because they've replaced now every piece of instrumentation, the first camera was replaced, and now they've replaced both spectrometers and the second camera. Each time they replaced and upgraded the spectrometers and the cameras, they took advantage of the fact that they knew what the error in the mirror was, and therefore they fitted the relevant corrective optics into the new instruments. So by now, in early 2000, about 2002 or so, now every instrument has been swapped out with a replacement and therefore all of them work perfectly without the need for CoStar. So a few years on, a few things started to fail. NASA said we would like another shuttle service mission. Congress said it's too expensive. NASA said we really, really, really do need this last service mission before the shuttles go out of service. And so money was found and eventually in 2009 service Mission four, replaced the second camera with a new third camera. Again, why? Because technology marches on. It's now possible to introduce a higher resolution camera. That's what this chip I showed you earlier was for. The earlier cameras had smaller chips. The camera three had a larger chip, so it could take higher resolution, wider angle images. CoStar is no longer needed because all of the instruments now have all the resolution they need. So CoStar was removed, brought back to Earth and put in a museum. And that was replaced with yet another spectrometer. A reminder at the end of the day that Hubble has got two cameras, but three spectrometers. We tend to think of cameras as being the important thing to produce images, but arguably spectrometers that give you a spectrum of a star or a nebula or a galaxy are arguably more important because a camera can tell you what it looks like, but a spectrum can tell you what it's made of or how it's behaving or the dynamics or its motion. So at the end of the day, 2009, we now have camera three, a new spectrometer and everything else was given a tune up to try and make sure it was as reliable as possible. And as far as I know, everything is still working reasonably well now in 2021. If nothing substantially fails, there's no reason why Hubble doesn't go on to produce just as good science and just as good images and just as valuable spectra for many years to come. It is thought that what will happen first is not necessarily failure of the cameras or the spectrometer. It might be failures of the gyro that keep it pointing at the object in question. As soon as you can't any longer stably point at the object you want, then unfortunately the instruments become redundant. So that might be the first sign of failure in years to come. But for the moment, everything appears good. 
So how has the Hubble contributed to our extending our understanding of the structure and the evolution of the universe, both close to home and at the cosmological scales? Well, of course, I haven't got time to cover everything, so I'm just going to pick out a few bits and pieces and just say a few words about how Hubble has extended our understanding. This might look a little bit like uh, an image of part of our Milky Way, but in, in fact, this is part of the Andromeda galaxy. And here we're looking at some stars that might be in the foreground in our own Milky Way, but a number of these stars are in the, in the Andromeda galaxy itself. And Cepheid variable stars are stars that vary in luminosity and the period with which they vary in time, if you count how many days from the maximum of one to the maximum of the next variation in luminosity, it's been found that that period of luminosity change is directly related to how bright the star is. We found that from looking at Cepheid variables in our own galaxy. So if you look at Cepheid variables in Andromeda and you watch them change in brightness and you measure their period, then you know how bright they are. And if you know how bright they are and you know how bright they look by looking at whether they are faint or bright and calculating precisely how much light is coming out of that star, you can work out how far away they are. It's part of the cosmic distance ladder, the idea of looking at Cepheids in other galaxies. You have to, of course, have the resolution to be able to pick out individual stars in a distant galaxy. It's no good just having a galaxy in which all of the spiral arms just seem to blur together. You need to be able to pick out individual stars. And if you can follow their brightness, you can work out their absolute brightness. And by looking at their relative or apparent brightness, you can work out the distance. And so one of the things that the Hubble Space Telescope did was establish the distance ladder in accurately determining the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. So the universe suddenly got just a little bit bigger because it revised our understanding of the distance scale. We now believe that the Andromeda galaxy is about 2.5 million light years away. The Hubble Space Telescope was essentially the first telescope that had the resolution to actually image exoplanets. Yes, planets around other stars had been found by indirect methods, looking for whether the star wobbles as, this, as the planet goes around it, or looking for a planet going in front of a star and changing the brightness that you see. But the Hubble Space Telescope had the resolution to actually see individual planets. So the star is here, it's effectively masked out and we're looking here at a lot of scattered light, which looks very odd, but down here in the inset, we see, we see two bright pixels here, which appear to move over the period of a couple of years or so. So it was imaged at one point in 2004, a couple of years it came back and imaged it again and it found this bright speck appears to be moving in an orbit around this, uh, this star. Too faint to be another star, so that is uh, so-called Formal B. Formal Oat is the name of the star, and so it appears that we have a directly imaged planet. Not only can it image planets, but because it's got these spectrometers, remember they're arguably even more important than having cameras on board. If you look at the spectrum from these planets, you can see whether or not there's any sign of any water absorption, and so Hubble has been used to actually look at not just whether an exoplanet exists, but what is the chemistry of the atmosphere of this particular exoplanet to see whether there's any interesting possibilities of life on distant planets. Of course, it's able, the Hubble is able to image close by galaxies in amazing detail. And there we get an idea of how galaxies evolve by looking at some of the closest galaxies where we can see a huge amount of detail. But if we look at more distant galaxies, we get different information, not necessarily the evolution of individual galaxies, but more the evolution of the universe on larger scales. Here, Hubble was looking at a, uh, a cluster of galaxies, which is massive enough to bend the light from more distant objects that's passing through this cluster, which is why some of these more distant objects, which look a little bit bluer than the orangey galaxies that are this galaxy cluster that's bending the light passing, 
these distant objects are being lensed and that allows the Hubble to get some idea of how much dark matter is in our universe. This is important for understanding the evolution of the universe on a cosmic scale rather than on a local scale. But on observing what's going on with this particular cluster lensing a more distant galaxy, it was noticed that this galaxy, which is blown up here on the right, seems to have four bright specks in it. Is this four supernova that are going off at the same time? You might normally expect uh, a supernova to go off maybe once every few decades or once every hundred years or two in a galaxy. Is it likely that a, in a particular snapshot you've actually got four going off at the same time? No, what's thought to be going on here is fortuitously there's another galaxy, a rather orangey galaxy, sitting right in front in terms of our line of sight, right in front of this rather bluish galaxy, and again that's producing a lensing effect. We can see a little diagram here, what we think is going on, light from distant galaxy is being bent as it passes through this galaxy cluster, and so there's lots of paths of light from the distant galaxy that all arrive at the Hubble Space Telescope. And in particular, in this case, this galaxy is again bending light such that a single supernova in a distant galaxy is being bent as it passes this rather massive galaxy. And just like a lens, those four light rays are being bent and focused such that they end up in the Hubble Space Telescope. But remember the speed of light is fixed, so you can see that some of these paths are longer than others. Sometimes it takes quite a substantial dogleg, and so each of them is a different distance back in time. And therefore it was realized that although these all appear to have gone off at roughly the same time and all appear to be very similar, this same galaxy has actually been lensed and appears over here. Again, if we go back to our diagram, the same galaxy is imaged as if it was here, and as if it was there, and as if it was there, because the light is taking different routes through this galaxy cluster and being lensed by the enormous mass of this cluster bending the light. So this same galaxy is being lensed here, but apparently doesn't have the supernova. Remember, the dogleg will take longer, light will take longer to go that dogleg, so we're looking back a little bit further in time by what is thought to be probably a few months. The theorists grabbed hold of this data and said, well, if we can see the supernova going off here, we reckon that the supernova will appear to go off in this galaxy in another six months time by working out that that light is six months behind the other light. In other words, the light taking this path is going to be six months behind the light taking the more direct path from the galaxy to the telescope. And that prediction was borne out because six months later, they instructed Hubble to go back and look at that galaxy and lo and behold, they saw the supernova going off. Normally, you don't get the chance of seeing a supernova go off. You normally only catch a supernova after it's brightened enough to see it. This is one of the few times they actually had a heads up because of the way light travels through the universe. Quite an incredible find that required the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope to see that level of detail. And of course the Hubble Deep Field has been looking as far back in time as it's possible to go with these sorts of telescopes. In principle you can use other wavelengths and you can use microwaves to look back to the cosmic microwave background. But in terms of looking at galaxies with the Hubble Deep Field they looked at a patch of sky exposed for as long as possible about 10 days or so. They weren't sure what they were going to see, but it transpired they saw thousands upon thousands of galaxies, which now gives us a much better idea of how the universe is constructed. And because the further back you look, the further out you look, the further back in time you're looking, it also gives us a handle on looking back what did the universe look like the first billion or two billion years after the Big Bang compared to what the galaxies look like now when we look at some of our nearest neighbors. And again, I remind you that the Hubble Deep Field, if it's produced with a chip that's no bigger than about that, at a focal length of 58 meters, that means you're looking at a very small patch of sky. There's a very large patch of sky with the moon and the Hubble Deep Field or any of the images that you see with the Hubble Space Telescope would be about the size of the red rectangle. So if you imagine that compared to the size of the moon, it gives you an idea of just how small a patch of sky was actually seen. The larger patch of sky in the background is about one degree 
across. And you can see it's a very small fraction of that. And Hubble has since taken images from different chunks of sky just to make sure that it wasn't a fluke the first time it took the deep field. It's then looked at different patches of sky and gone even deeper to generate the Hubble ultra deep field in which, again, there are thousands of galaxies, different colours, different shapes, different distances and hence different look back times into the universe. I've already mentioned the fact that when we're looking at a galaxy cluster, that cluster will tend to distort light coming from more distant galaxies. So we've got these orangey galaxies in the foreground. These more distant galaxies in blue seem to be distorted into what are sometimes very long and elongated arcs. These are normal galaxies that the view of them has been distorted by the way the light is bending as it goes through the galaxy cluster. And images like this have enabled us to get a much better handle on where dark, mit dark matter is and how much there must be out there in order to bend light the way it does. And that's part of the jigsaw that's enabled us to get a handle on the fact that there appears to be much more dark matter out there than there is visible matter. We're still trying to get a handle on exactly what it is, but images such, a, such as this has enabled us to get a much better idea of just how much dark matter is out there. So I've said something about the scientific legacy and what the Hubble has done for us, but it's managed to do something that most scientific instruments have failed to do. It's managed to pull the public along for the ride. It's touched the public consciousness. The laws of physics have created these incredible structures and Hubble has revealed them. The incredible structures being either star systems or nebula like the pillars of creation or distant galaxies. Through all the research, Hubble has brought the public along for the ride. It's taken the excitement that scientists feel with new discoveries and brought it to non-scientists. So, Given that I wanted to remind people not only about the wonderful science that the Hubble Space Telescope has done, uh, yes, looking at spectra only get you so far. So let's have a look at some of the wonderful images that the Hubble has produced. So these are simply a few of my favorites. The Helix Nebula or Helix Nebula is a very large nebula. It's, it's huge in its angular diameter. So the Hubble had to take a mosaic to get all of this in. The Helix Nebula low down in the south as seen from the UK. You can actually photograph it with a telephoto lens. It's so big, you don't need a telescope. So it's quite amazing that Hubble managed to capture all of this uh, in a mosaic. The antenna galaxies, I love this one. It doesn't show you all of the tidal tails that gives the antenna galaxies its name, but it shows you such wonderful detail as these two galaxies are colliding. It shows you that you get all of this pink, all of this hydrogen star forming regions. Whenever two galaxies collide, it tends to catalyze and produce an awful lot of star formation. And it's thought that a lot of this, a lot of star formation is not simply down to a quiescent galaxy sitting there spinning away in space, but as soon as you collide galaxies together, it can give star formation a real kick. The Crab Nebula, we've known about this, of course, for a long time, but the Hubble simply allowed us to look at the exquisite detail in the supernova remnant in a way that simply wasn't possible with other techniques. Mystic Mountain, not the Pillars of Creation, but a very similar structure. This one is down in the Southern Hemisphere rather than the Pillars of Creation in the Constellation of Serpents. But again, structures that are effectively sculpted by the radiation from hot stars. One of my favorite galaxies, the Sombrero Galaxy. Again, amateurs can photograph this in the constellation of Virgo, a very distinctive dark band, but the resolution of the Hubble simply brings out all of the structure in that sort of equatorial plane, if you think of it that way. A globular cluster, and this is a nice reminder of the fact that when most telescopes look at a globular cluster, there are simply so many stars. And if you don't have sufficient resolution, you simply can't see the detail within the center of the cluster. So a lot of people study globular clusters by looking at the stars towards the outer part of the globular cluster. 
but the Hubble Space Telescope has got the resolution to be able to see individual stars even into the heart of a lot of these globular clusters, even though they contain perhaps hundreds of thousands of stars. Given the resolution, you can do more science as well as producing beautiful images like that. The images of spiral galaxies, I think, are just wonderful. This happens to be one with a very large bar, which, I, again, I just think is aesthetically very pleasing. Galaxies are always in collision. And if you keep looking at galaxies, you will keep finding interactions between galaxies. In this case, what appears to be a spiral galaxy is being distorted at the top by the presence of a galaxy nearby. And because of its appearance, this has become known as the Rose galaxies. This is one that I really like because it's the Veil Nebula, which again, a lot of amateurs have seen and photographed, but this just gives you an idea of the amazing amount of detail you can see, especially if you take images at particular wavelengths that correspond to hydrogen or correspond to oxygen or correspond to sulfur, or in this particular case, I think a couple of other elements as well. If you color code each of those images, you end up with not only an amazing image that gives you an idea of the structure, you get an idea of the chemistry as well, because you can start to unravel where various um, atoms exist within this structure. Pillars of creation, I guess I had to show this. It's so iconic. It was taken early in the 1990s, as soon as the camera was fixed, and then it was re-imaged for its 25th birthday using, again, the full size of the chip of the new uh, camera three. So this is taken from the latest camera, a slightly higher resolution compared to what we saw back in the 1990s taken with the original camera. And of course, the ultra deep field, we've already seen that the fact that we can penetrate so far into the past and see so much rich structure in an area of sky which was apparently featureless, apart from what appears to be two stars which are sitting in our own Milky Way, everything else is out there at distance of many billions of light years. So that was a, a rather rapid jog through some of my favorite images. But what lies beyond Hubble? Surely ground-based telescopes have adaptive optics. They can compensate for the Earth's turbulent atmosphere. For instance, they can generate an artificial star using a laser, as indicated here. Shine a laser into the upper atmosphere, watch that little spot of light that you generate, and if that spot of light seems to be jumping around because of the Earth's atmosphere, then you move your mirrors in such a way that you try and compensate for the Earth's atmospheric changes. So doesn't that then get rid of the need for a space telescope? Well, not really, because that works OK if you shine a piece of light, a laser light into the atmosphere and watch what it happens. But the air moving here is not the same as the air moving over there or the air moving over here. It's a chaotic system. So you can see what's going on in one particular chunk of sky and correct for it, but it won't necessarily correct for other parts of your image, depending on what your field of view is. So yes, these, whoops, these large telescopes are coming online, such as the 30 meter telescope and the European Extremely Large Telescope, and they will be able to move the various parts of the mirror, not necessarily the primary mirror, it might be the secondary or tertiary mirrors that are moved to compensate for the motion of the atmosphere, but only where they have an artificial star. And you can't put a million artificial stars up there without completely eradicating the field of view that you're trying to measure. So even ground-based telescopes, even if they've got very good adaptive optics, they'll only be able to achieve that over a limited field of view. Whereas a space telescope gets supposedly perfect vision over the entire CCD chip, providing it's manufactured to spec, basically. Let's just remind ourselves of other space telescopes that are already up there. Kepler has now been decommissioned, but of course it had a very specific mission to look for Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. It was looking by staring at a particular patch of sky, that was its detector, and that's what it was looking at, a patch of sky in between Cygnus in the bottom left and 
Uh, you can see Vega and Lyra over on the right there. This particular patch of sky it wasn't trying to survey the whole sky. It was just staring at one patch of sky, measuring the intensity, the brightness of the stars over and over and over again, looking for particular dips in the brightness that could indicate that an exoplanet has transited in front of one of those stars. And of course, it's found, it's found many thousands of exoplanets, which are now being followed up by other telescopes um, looking to see if they can get more detail, more information about those exoplanets. Gaia had a very different mission, and that was to measure the positions of billions of stars. That might sound very boring, simply measuring positions, but if you measure positions and you do that repeatedly, and you do it accurately, not just to arc seconds or milli arc seconds, but better than an accuracy of milli arc seconds of order perhaps 25 micro arc seconds. That would be totally impossible from ground based um, observatories. But with a satellite like Gaia, they can get that sort of accuracy. And if they repeat the observations, then they get not only the star positions, but if they repeat it every few days, months or years, they know how stars are moving, both in terms of their proper motion, in terms of um, how they're moving, whether or not stars are changing their positions, whether or not they are orbiting the Milky Way by looking literally at how they are moving and getting an idea of their distance. It can also do some spectral as well as photometric measurements. So it can derive star velocities to for perhaps a billion stars, still only a very small fraction of all the stars in the Milky Way, of course, but with a large sample of a billion stars, you can get a pretty good idea of how the Milky Way is moving, and you can get a pretty good idea of the 3D structure of the Milky Way. That's its aim, to produce a 3D map of the Milky Way. Some of the data releases have already been made. Some of you have might heard about the Gaia data release. Um, Astronomers, scientists, data miners will take all of the data that's coming out of Gaia and sit down and run programs to try and work out, well, what does this actually mean? And part of it they've used, for instance, to work out that there's actually a satellite galaxy to the Milky Way they didn't know about that Gaia has now found. But coming back to the Hubble Space Telescope, let's just reflect on that for a minute, if you'll excuse the pun. What's the successor? Hubble won't last forever. It's been great for the last 30 years. It might have another five years left in it. It might have more than five years left in it. But what is going ultimately to replace it? I'm sure you've heard of the James Webb Space Telescope. Just like the Hubble in its early days, its launch has been put back year after year after year. It was supposed to be launched many years ago. And currently, it's, uh, it's uh, hopefully only going to be months away now rather than many years away. So what is the James Webb? It's going to be a large mirror compared to the Hubble. You see the scale there. The Hubble is about 2.4 meters in diameter. The James Webb Space Telescope will be of order six meters. And it will be made in segments and it will be folded up to go into the fairing of a rocket. And then when it's in position, it will be unfolded into the configuration that you can see there. Unlike the Hubble, which is orbiting the Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be sent on a rather long journey to what is colloquially known as L2. There are a number of points around the Earth's orbit called Lagrange points where you can effectively park a telescope or a satellite. Uh, one of them is between the Earth and the Sun, but one of the reasons for taking the James Webb to one of the Lagrange points is to get it away from the Earth. The James Webb is going to be looking in the infrared and the Earth is warm or hot and is going to be generating a lot of infrared, so we want to take the telescope as far away as possible. It doesn't make sense to go to these other Lagrange points, it certainly doesn't make any sense to go to the other side of the Sun, and so they decided to go to L2. L2 is about one million miles away from Earth, so if you travel beyond the Moon for about a million miles on a line directly away from the Earth, you find a point where you can park a uh, spacecraft and it will essentially stay there. In other words, it will go round with the Earth and it will take one year to go round. Relative to the Earth, it will seem to be stationary. Actually, they put it in a small orbit around that point. Rather than try and find the L2 point precisely, they make a little orbit around L2. That's where Gaia is and that's where James Webb is going to go as well. There's actually a few satellites there. It's going to start getting crowded. James Webb, I think, probably won't have to nudge Gaia out of the way, but 
by putting them in slightly different orbits, you can put a number of different satellites in that position away from Earth. And you'd still need to worry about the heat from the sun. And so that's why they have these large shields that we saw in the previous image. What will the James Webb actually do? Well, it'll work in the infrared. There's no point, well, you could argue there is a point to make a duplicate of the HST, but they're not making a duplicate of the Hubble. They're intending to work in a slightly different part of the spectrum. Hubble worked mainly in the visible and a little bit into the infrared. The James Webb is going to effectively work in the infrared. So we can see a little bit about what the James Webb might be able to see by looking, for instance, at the pillars of creation here, taken in visible light. And then on the right hand side, we can see the same pillars of creation taken on the same camera, but this time at infrared wavelengths, about as far as Hubble can go into the infrared. And you see it looks completely different. And that's because visible light and infrared light get scattered rather differently by the dust that's in these structures in these uh, gaseous pillars. And visible light gets scattered quite strongly, so it's very difficult to see what's going on inside one of these pillars. We have to assume if we only have visible light. But if we use infrared light, we tend to get more of an x-ray, if you excuse the pun, more penetration inside these pillars so we can see what's actually going on. And in some cases, we can start see stars that are on the other side of the pillars, which are completely invisible in the visible image on the left hand side. So if we want to see what's going on inside nebula, then infrared is the way to go. Also, if we want to see how solar systems are forming from, from proto solar systems, then again, that's a very dusty environment and it's very difficult to see with visible light how solar systems form in early stars. But with infrared, we should be able to cut through a lot of that dust and see much more detail. So seeing inside nebula, seeing inside planetary systems in formation are a couple of elements of what the James Webb will do. But there's one other as well, and that is when we think about things like the Hubble Deep Field, remember we are going further back in time as we see further and further into the distance, 10 billion light years or 11 or 12, we're going back in time to the very early part of the, uh, of the universe's existence, and those galaxies are receding from us at very high speeds. In some cases, some of those galaxies are actually receding from us faster than light. And what happens is as the recession velocity goes higher and higher and higher, then the light from those galaxies gets shifted more and more and more towards the red end of the spectrum because of an effect called the Doppler shift. Now, if galaxies tend to emit most of their light in the visible spectrum, which on the whole they do, then the more distant galaxies, which are receding from us extremely fast, are gonna be red shifted more and more into the infrared. So we might be able to see them in the visible part of the spectrum, but they tend to get very faint. Whereas if we were to look at those same galaxies in the infrared part of the spectrum, they might be quite bright because that's where most of the light from those galaxies has been shifted by their very fast recessional velocity. So hopefully the James Webb Space Telescope when it takes the equivalent of a Hubble deep field, we'll be able to see even further back in time even further back towards the Big Bang to the very earliest galaxies that formed very shortly after the Big Bang itself. So I've given you an introduction as to why we need space telescopes and ground-based alternatives. I gave you a little bit of the history of how the mirror was flawed and why it was flawed and how they fixed it with the various pieces of optics. And I've given you a brief indication of how Hubble has helped us understand the universe and how it pulled the public along for the ride. And then I finished with a short indication of where things are heading in the future and a reminder that ground based telescopes are not the be all and end all of the future. There is still a need for space telescopes. And let's, hub let's hope that Hubble continues at least for a few more years to deliver on that. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that, Steve. It was, it was an excellent presentation tonight. And I'm sure like myself, everyone attending has thoroughly enjoyed it as well. The HST has produced not only spectacular images, 
but an incredible amount of information over the last 30 years to further our knowledge of the universe. So let's thank Steve in the usual way. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all very much. Stop sharing so we can see each other again. Hello. Oh, you're still there. Excellent. There we are. <laughs> Steve, that was absolutely <laughs> fabulous. That was exceptional talk. Very, very yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you liked uh, it. Thank you very much. First class presentation. Absolutely yep. loved it. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions for Steve? Yes, please, if I may. The one that's always puzzled me is... How do they clean the mirrors inside the Hubble Space Telescope? <laughs> Nobody's ever answered that for me. Uh, as far as I know, it's not very dusty up there. Okay. <laughs> so the answer is they don't. Okay. Can I have one more? Oh, yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. So um, the Hubble Space Telescope uses can measure the near infrared? Uh, yes. Is it would it have been possible to do a service mission to put in a, a far infrared detector into it? They would have had to replace the camera. Yeah, appreciate uh, that. that. So, they would have had to sacrifice one camera in order to fit another. So yeah. they would they would have compromised its ability to continue doing the science it's doing. That's the bottom line. Yeah, and it was and, and it was not considered necessary, knowing that James Webb is coming in due course. Yes. Hoping this mirror is on board. Can I ask a question? Oh, well, um, just, just, could, this some, just, could I just comment on that remark? Because the Hubble telescope's not cooled. So if you put a far infrared camera and in, you're going to be drowned by heat radiation from the telescope itself. The JWST, the James Webb telescope, is cooled so it can work a much longer wavelength. And okay. will be shielded from the heat sources, etc., which the Hubble isn't. The, hu the Hubble is sitting next to a warm Earth. <laughs> So does that affect at all the shape of the mirror or, is it, I mean, is it, it's not facing the same way all the time, is it? It's, uh... Sorry, are we still talking about the Hubble or the James West? No, sorry, I was talking about the Hubble, thank you, Pat. <laughs> yeah, so what was the question, is it? Well, uh, it's not facing the same way all the time. Yes. Uh, how, would, how does temperature from the Earth or, or from the sun affect it? Uh, temperature, you know, the, uh, the heat from the Earth to the sun. Does it have any effect at all on possibly on the shape of the mirror? Does it does it vary in temperature very much? It doesn't vary too much, but they do have to watch out when it's going from daylight to night and from night to day. It's it's in a it's in an orbit which takes it round every ninety minutes or so, and so yes, every once in a while it goes from day to night and night to day. So they try, if possible, not to observe during those few minutes. In other words, they, they don't quite shut it down. They do other jobs while it's transitioning into shade or out of shade, and it will take a little bit of time for it to settle, and then they start observing again. Exactly how long that is, I don't know. Okay. Any can other I, questions? Can I come in with just one interesting thing that I've done over the years? And that's to go into the Hubble um, archives and bring out the raw files and then put them into a imaging like uh, Photoshop and reconstruct or actually construct some of the images, which is good fun if somebody is. Yes, it's paid for by taxpayers. Therefore, everything is in the public domain. So you're mm -hmm. quite right. Everything is available if you want to have a play. You can download the raw files and see if you can generate a Pillars of Creation just like the original. It's really such good fun. <laughs> could, could I ask a question, please? Yes, was that uh, Alan or was that... Simon? Simon, Simon. Simon, sorry, I'm yeah. jumping around all over the place. Simon, <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, thanks for a great talk, very interesting. I was just wondering if there, uh, possibilities or what you think about the possibilities for locating telescopes on the lunar surface, perhaps on the far side? You could do that, but you still end up in sunlight every once in a while. Mm. So it's not the dark side, remember, it's the far side. So for Indeed. half the time, yes. you're going to be sunlit. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, the, it's not a bad <laughs> idea for a radio telescope because it shields you from the Earth. 
Yes, exactly. But for a visible telescope, you're still going to be in sunlight half the time. Mm -hmm. So the only benefit is is for that for that time when you don't, you have a clear sky and no atmospheric effects or turbulence. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so for half the time, you will gain some advantage. It's a very expensive way of getting an advantage for half the time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, unless you're going there to do something else at the same uh, time. Yes, if you happen to if you happen to be going anyway, then by all means take a telescope with you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do some geology while you're at it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Chinese. Would there not be a problem receiving a signal if it's always on the far side of the moon? <laughs> oh, you just you just have a few orbiters. I see. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. You just you just put a few uh, satellites in orbit. I'm sure Elon Musk will will oblige. <laughs> Just uh, yeah. Can I ask you a question as well? With, with regard to the James Webb uh, telescope, will there be any optical uh, devices on it, or is it all infrared? I think it's all infrared. I don't know quite what range it covers, but um, th there will be there will be some overlap with the HST, but very small. It's a shame in a way because I know the, the science is improved by the, the infrared as, you, as you've explained so well. But there's something about the optical images which are really appeal to the public, I think it's not like to me. Well, if you take images at infrared wavelengths, there's nothing to stop you colouring them red, green and blue and generating images. Remember, Pillars of Creation is not true colour. Mm -hmm. It was imaged at hydrogen wavelengths, imaged at oxygen wavelengths, imaged at mm, sulphur. And then they took those three wavelengths and said, I'm going to make that one red, that one green, that one blue. They don't actually um, relate at all to the actual colours of those wavelengths. Yeah. Oh. The pillars of creation are not blue and green. They're actually red. If you, ever, if you ever take an image yourself as an amateur astronomer, virtually everything in the universe that's made of hydrogen will glow red. Hubble images only look green or blue or yellow because they've chosen to take those wavelengths and put them into Photoshop and make that red, that green and that blue. And there's no reason why you don't do the same with infrared. So in terms of aesthetics, mm. there's going to be no damage there. You can produce aesthetically pleasing infrared images just as you can with optical images. Oh, fine. Uh, a question, Charlie here. That was very clear, clear talk. Thank you. Um, with the James Webb, Webb telescope, how nervous are, are people about <laughs> it actually working and how complicated it is? Uh, yes, I think for all those reasons that A, we don't want to make another Hubble. I'm sure, I don't know how many people have said we do not want to make the same mistake as Hubble. Are we absolutely sure everything is right? And then you have two major problems. One is the mirror has to unfold and be in position accurately enough to act as one mirror, not lots of little mirrors. And those sails have to unfold. The heat shield, which is uh, five layers, I think, <clears throat> has to unfold. It's about the size of a tennis court or something. They have to unfurl correctly for it to work. And once you've got it to L2, I don't think there's much option for bringing it back again. So once it's there, no servicing. And uh, if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. So compared to the Hubble, which was built deliberately with, if anything goes wrong, we send the astronauts up to fix it. That's not really a possibility with James Webb. So all of the automated bits of it, the, the deployment of the mirror, the deployment of the, of the uh, shields, and ultimately the deployment to L2 has to work. And if anything goes wrong, it could be disastrous. So yes, I think that's one of the reasons they're delaying is they are checking and checking and checking and rechecking. And hopefully they've thought of every possible thing that can go wrong. But of course, it's the thing you don't think of that gets you. If I were them, I'd be very nervous. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Do we have any questions in the chat or is it just chit chat? I think it's just <laughs> chit chat. <laughs> right, so no more questions mm. then? Yeah. 
Right. Um, so let's thank Steve again in the usual way. Thank you, Steve. Excellent talk. Yeah.